Good morning, everyone. Can you confirm you can hear me? Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Natalie Triana. Welcome to the seminar on reaching carbon neutrality in the concrete and cement industry from Latin America and the Caribbean. On behalf of BSEM, representing producing companies in Latin America and the Caribbean, and the National Union of Laboratories and Materials Experts, RELIM, we welcome you. This seminar will be, will have as a conference, uh, Ricardo Pareja Soto and Yuri Villagran. And we will also have moderation by Susan Bernal, a professor in Instructional Material from Leeds University. Susan Bernal, is from Valle University, Colombia. She receives several uh, recognitions internationally for developing low carbon cement. With more than 15 years of scientific experience, she and her group of uh, research have studied construction materials to provide value in ways to provide alternative materials and have different reactions between concrete and other materials, developing non-traditional cement, circular economies, and other matters. We rec Let's remind everyone that we have simultaneous translation if you need it. On the bottom of your screens, you will find an interpretation button. It's a globe, and there you can choose the language you like to listen to. It can be in, in English or in the original language, which will be Spanish. During the conference, you can ask your questions on the panel on the right hand side and at the end we will have some time for the conferences conference givers to answer your questions please specify who your question is addressing so we can facilitate the moderation and with that i'll give the floor to susan bernard welcome susan thank you so much good morning and good afternoon good evening depending on where you are it's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to moderate this seminar, particularly because it's a very uh, recent subject, which is very interesting. And as Natalie mentioned, it involves an article which was published recently in, in uh, Rylip Magazine. Today, we have two excellent presenters. First, we have Ricardo Pareja Soto. He's an acoustic engineer with a master's in environment from Santiago de Chile University. He's a lead auditor in ISO 14001 in geological services, mining, and others. He has worked in sustainability and labor security at Cementos Limon, a Lafarge group company that was acquired by Brexia. He has worked also as an innovation director and has been involved in the PSEM roadmap towards a low carbon economy, representing the commitment to the cement industry in Latin America and reducing emissions. Today, we also have Dr. Juri Villagran Shakati. He is a researcher. in Belgium. He is a civil engineer from National University in Argentina with a doctorate in La Plata University, also in Argentina. He also has a master's in, in construction innovation and technology and construction and concrete construction in Argentina. He developed a prestigious uh, firm in Benedict Lab Laboratory and get at Get University in Belgium, and has also worked in Argentina. He was the secretary for the Rillum Group, and has engaged in several technical committees in improving eco efficiency and in assessing the, the duration of cement products. Welcome, Ricardo. Welcome, Yuri. We're very eager to hear from you. And I'll give the floor to Ricardo then. 
Thank you, Susan, for that introduction and for this opportunity to share with you. Uh, uh, there is, in fact, a paper that will be launched in Spanish. Can you confirm that you can hear me okay, Susan? We can hear you just fine. We don't see your presentation yet, though, so if you can go ahead and share your screen. Yes, one second. Perfect. Great. Thank you. I should begin by introducing FISEM, which is the uh, federation that represents the industry in the region. Oftentimes, we minimize our scope because it's just the South American region, but this also includes Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and all South America. Our main goals have always been and continue to be to promote the use of cemented concrete in the 20th and the 21st century, uh, given the industry's growth and the adaptation and the, and the poverty gaps that we have in our region. We also seek to accelerate the global agenda on sustainability. And for five years now, we've been leading the industry in carbon neutrality and circular economies, which I think are the key pillars for development in the industry and in other continents for the coming years. We reach out to 24 countries in the region. 71% of the, of, of the production in the region and 12 institutes and associations, which has allowed us to address the issues in the region by not having regional tools such as Europe might have or others might have that can be grouped to create public policy. Regarding this presentation, I will move on this pillar, which is leading carbon neutrality in industry, which is a pillar that we have always engaged in with the international press, especially when it comes to public policy and world policy on the matter. And we've assumed the responsibility of reducing our footprint explaining in a very clear way how this climatic uh, or this climate strategy has helped with emissions reductions and has also made us adapt and become resilient. We have learned uh, um, that this goes much more beyond the uh, this one subject, and we've seen how various products have had substitutes with better performance and other products such as cement have to be carbon neutral, which is key to development and not only development, but also in adapting and in resilience as the planet needs it. We have started off on a, on a very well in this matter since 2007 in reducing our footprint which has become the foundation of reducing the CO2 footprint. And since 2010, we have joined in this initiative, reducing the footprint by 80%, which is the highest in the world for the region. And it's all supported by FISEM. In 2015, and with the COP21, with the Paris Accords and everything else, we decided that we not only had to re measure, but reduce our emissions. And that's why we established the roadmap for Latin America and the Caribbean that due to political differences and lack of statistics had to be done locally. We had to create roadmaps for company, which was a lot of work to look at the realities locally and see what FISEM might uh, contribute to in reducing the carbon footprint together with the needs and the barriers that development entails in this new agenda. Since 2021, and boosted by the IPCC report. It's not now only about reducing carbon neutrality, but the challenge also becomes broader and the times become shorter with greater challenges ahead. So how do we address this? First, by understanding that in general, 
We are not a single process. We're not working in an island. In society, as you can see, unfortunately, the footprint has been growing instead of reducing. That is, the Paris Accord is still not showing its results, hence the importance of understanding why. Uh, and in addition to understanding the why and the how, we are aiming to reduce uh, uh, CO2 emissions by 1.2 uh, uh, billion tons per year. This includes Argentina, which, uh, and Chile as well, uh, where the practice is no small feat. And cement does play a key role here because it is characterized by, by having 7% of total emissions. When you double click and look at the past statistics, you find some strategies for the future. This double click, for example, when we look at the next uh, graphic, we can see that the country's development, the eradication of poverty and improving quality of life has a lot to do with the footprint. We can see how in the 60s, China and India had a very low footprint, but how China or since China developed extensively, their footprint grew extensively. So there is a matter of improving quality of life, and, and, uh, but there's also the matter of CO2 emissions. So we understand that this plays a key role in our region, but for the very first time, we're going to strive to reduce the footprint. Developed countries have already done this, and fundamentally the economies like the American and the European were responsible for half of the emissions in the last century. And then, and then it became China. And this cannot be done in an isolated manner. The countries and regions need to do this together. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Here we can see Shanghai in the 90s, Shanghai in 2020, that is 30 years later. You can see the development, how quality of life improved. And this is, isn't just about the picture. There's also an underground metro, there's a sewer system, security systems, climate resilience, et cetera, et cetera. So coming from subdevelopment to overdevelopment entails a significant consumption of concrete and cement. How today do we work this growth and improve quality of life with a reduction in footprint? That is the challenge. There are many statistics, and we understand that we have to share certain statistics with all of you in the sense that anyone, develop, anyone living in a developed country in their day-to-day -day interacts with 30 tons of cement, and in an undeveloped country, it's 10. So we want to reduce the poverty in our regions by 60%, uh, especially for those who don't have access to potable water and other services. Antonio Guterres said this in his own words. He says, we are developing and spending towards the new climate situation to provide better resilience. So things start to become complicated. And this is how we understand that developing our climate agenda as cement producers is not enough, that we have to address the entire life cycle and all of these structures around them. Uh, the context in the region is complex. One third of the population is below the poverty line. 20% of the population lives in human settlements. And this is really important because these are the places where people mostly live. Basically, 20% of all people will live in cities. And having good cities would improve quality of life significantly. So we are in this stage of improving city quality of life. But with, uh, but where cement and concrete plays a key role. 22% of roads are paved. Basically... Uh, that affects our connectivity. And uh, we are the number two most vulnerable region when it comes to climate and natural disasters worldwide, which places yet another challenge to our agenda. And today we're investing 2.5% of the GDP in our respective countries, where it should be four. So hopefully in the next decade, economic growth and focusing on development to eradicate poverty will improve. And that will entail the growth of cement in the region. As far as construction, we are quite informal and substandard, I would say. This substandardization and this informality is a short-term challenge. When you build with informality, you end up using 20% more material than, it, than 
in an industrialized way, and that increases the footprint. So doing things right with the techniques that we have, that would entail a reduction. But that's just a pipe dream because the informality in construction in the region doesn't allow for that. We, uh, Judy will also speak about this, but we don't have the technical standards that are really fitting the Latin American uh, reality. We copy what North America and Europe does, and those standards not always address the technical quality as needed, as well as the challenges behind uh, climate change. Plus, we require new standards for resilient construction given that there's always a deficit in quality and, and, and this happens in the Caribbean with the housing, for example, with hurricanes and in, and in South America with El Nino and La Nina that cuts off uh, connectivity in roads because of insufficient, insufficient road structures. So we have many challenges ahead and well, that makes it very interesting when we look at all of this work. As far as FISEM, and this is the response that, that we have for carbon neutrality, is to look at the developed world. We've seen how cement has evolved. And the good news is that the world is mobilized around cement. Now 70% of cement production has roadmaps towards carbon neutrality. So we're not reinventing the wheel, but rather we're copying the best of models. And something that really draw our attention is the deficit that we find in roadmaps in, in developing economies. In general, North America, Europe, and China focus much of their production based on these roadmaps, but only India has a roadmap, uh, has had one for a year, and another uh, developing economies. So how to, how to establish roadmaps for development? I think there we can compare India and South America, but Africa will require much more cement in the future. So we are tasked with leading these developments in the future. And regarding this, as opposed to roadmaps throughout the world, we established our first pillar for carbon neutrality, aiming at the sustainable and resilient uh, construction in the region. And secondly, carbon neutrality is part of the strategy. And regarding carbon neutrality, we've developed the CCCA uh, uh, roadmap, which we believe is the roadmap that we have to use for the region. We signed the, uh, an agreement with GCCA in various countries, and we hope to establish local roadmaps with the GCCA model Again, with uh, uh, adjusting to their own specific realities at a regional level. And this is something that we developed in the region where we have 13 roadmaps underway, considering Brazil's as well. And again, a large part of the region has a good strategy underway. And in our experience in this development, and that's what we want to present today, is all the science and, and research that this entails. Some major figures around uh, development. It's interesting here to see that China with its high development is at 1.5 tons. That is five times more than Latin America uh, per capita, that is, uh, given the benefits that they have. Very similar to Europe uh, as far as the kilograms per capita, but that's a developed economy. Uh, where there are 30 tons in infrastructure and housing, and, and they can significantly reduce uh, their fingerprint because a lot of their development has already taken place as opposed to Latin America. So when you create a roadmap in economy, that is, these are the figures that you find. I won't go into the details on the figures, but basically our, our goal is to reduce our productive processes by 40%. That's where our emissions are mostly found. And we really want to focus on, on waste-based uh, fuels. But it's mostly about the use of the product. We want to look at the, the statistics to see how consumption has grown in the region. There's been a growth without technology, without improvements at 70%. There's a 15% when using technology, but using technology means that there's a gap of almost 40% that has to be reduced there. Whereas in, in developed countries, almost 50% of the countries have already been neutralized. So there's a big challenge there. And how do we do this? This is such an informal economy with such few standards or substandard construction that this happens. So in summary, the challenges for the GCCA uh, in, in large figures 
is really about understanding that we will no longer go from bottom to top as far as the agenda to improve clinker to make, to do to make better cement and better cement to make better con cement uh, better uh, concrete, but instead we want the construction to require less concrete and to be used in a more industrialized and formalized way, where concrete requires less cement to improve the efficiency and in, in construction codes, and where cement has less clinker and we can have the strength that it that it that is needed, and what we do do in the clinker has a low footprint using alternative fuels and other technologies. So our process goes the other way around. And with this solution, we can achieve this reduction where a third part of that solution depends on construction and what will be constructed, hence the work, the collective work that we're doing regionally. To conclude, amongst the products that we developed and that we, we are making available, we have our calculator, which is an instrument that consolidates data throughout the region to better understand the carbon footprint in, in metric tons of concrete, CO2 and raw materials, CO2 and fuels. Uh, what happens when I don't uh, produce a clinker and bring it from Asia? How do I develop areas with low CO2 content? How to have more efficient plants? What are the best mixes and the distribution channels? All of this has been included in the statistics to create the FISM calculator, no, the, the 3C FISM calculator, which has CO2 in its calculation model. And what we've seen, and this also is seen in, in the European agenda when it comes to the use of concrete and cement, is that we're not exactly delivering the proper strength. We, we provide materials that affect the carbon footprint based on its strength. That is by improving the technology and by improving our fuels with a proper regulatory framework and more efficiency, we can reduce the footprint in a short term with a significant percentage. 10% would be accounted for just uh, the use of certain products. These are all paradigms that we have to start to overcome to build this carbon neutral agenda. And to conclude, and why we're working with RELEM is because we understand that achieving carbon neutrality in our sector really depends on many more sectors that have dedicated a lot of time to the matter. In addition to FISEM, we've partnered with many other organizations that will help us in our process. Uh, together with uh, locally published papers to show Latin America's position in the global agenda and not just depend on, on Terra and formulas from developed uh, countries that do not exactly match the region. And this region has many opportunities. So what we're doing today is submitting our work together with RELEM in partnership. Gina Roja and myself work if we them to create a paper together with Yuri with all these statistics uh, and high-level academics that also engaged to see how by having better pr products and techniques, we can reduce our carbon footprint and move towards carbon neutrality. Thank you, Susan, and I'm here for your questions. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for a very important presentation. You touched on a very important subject, which makes us really think about the need to think about that balance between basic uh, development and sustainability. I always say that in times of crisis, there are also opportunities for change. So I think everything you've said today has immense potential so that our region is much more sustainable. Thank you so much, Ricardo. And now I'll give the floor to Yuri. Thank you very much, Susan. Let me share my screen. Please let me know when you can see it. Perfect. Very well. On my behalf, I will delve into a little bit of the technical aspects that Ricardo has already mentioned, especially emphasizing cement applications and creating concrete. I wouldn't want to 
go without thinking. The organizers, uh, Lina Rojas, uh, Edgardo Reza, Evangelate John, Ricardo Parejas, Andres Torres, and Jorge Tabon, uh, as well as myself, we all contributed to this. And the content that I will be presenting uh, is also uh, due to their contributions. Next. And I wanted to focus on certain questions in my presentation on how we see Cement as users, not from the production standpoint, as Ricardo already mentioned, but looking at what changes we could have in our habits to improve our use of Cement. So the first thing we have to say is that concrete is a product that is uh, governed by the law in the market, but concrete isn't the, it is mostly used to, to make non-structural products for masonry, for, I mean, for oftentimes, we surpass the technical requirements that we have for cement when creating these kinds of items uh, to make cement lasting and durable. But we have to keep in mind that most times uh, it's not only up to cement. So decoupling the cement market into structural and non-structural use can provide for substantial improvements in the use of clinkers where we could increase the factors to replace clinker. We say that cement is subject to the rules of the market. And in Latin America, where we have somewhat uh, fluctuating uh, markets, after every storm that is, the sun comes out and there are economic initiatives that really drive demand for cement and that sudden rise in the demand for cement can be met with products that are highly available. In Latin America, uh, we have uh, natural additives, uh, including including uh, natural elements uh, apart from fly ash. Cement has to go hand in hand with clinker production for the most part. So there are certain limitations from the commercial standpoints and the non-technical standpoints as far as reducing the carbon footprint. As Ricardo said very well, industrializing cement It's about reducing waste and better using cement in construction. And we see that internationally, the statistics show that this cement consumption, which might be bagged or, or in bulk, tend to be bagged in the, in the underdeveloped economies. So bagged cement increases waste and that's something that should be migrated towards cement in bulk to give it a better industrialized use. In Latin America, we're still somewhat behind in this sense uh, as far as their development. They might have a, a somewhat high level of bag cement consumption, which affects not only the producers, but also the the users where where greater industrialization industrialization has to be a strategy in Latin America and the Caribbean as a whole it's a very heterogeneous uh, society where bulk cement is only twenty percent of the market uh, in markets such as Guatemala and in Chile sixty percent of cement consumption is done in bulk. So the same strategy cannot be applied to all countries. The levels of industrialization vary extensively throughout the region. 
bagged cement is associated with uh, self-construction and more precarious and daily construction. For example, this study in Brazil shows comparatively how bagged cement consumption is much higher than elaborated uh, concrete at a much lower level. So industrialization as a strategy to reduce waste improve sustainability, but also improved quality control and mix up optimization, as Ricardo said, together with systematizing operations and maintaining cleanliness and construction, that all helps in reducing the footprint. Hence, the difference between prefab and, in, and on-site fabrication. There are major differences there which improve efficiency in as far as the use of material, where we have uh, less waste when it comes to construction and a higher quality in construction. This is something that in Latin America, apart from a few countries, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, the rest in the rest of the countries, the the industrialization level and the use of concrete is a little bit behind. And this would greatly improve the levels of efficiency in the industry and, of course, the environmental impact. Another question I find interesting is, do we focus on the application or the product? Because oftentimes you think that the only way of reducing the carbon footprint in cement and the cement industry is by reducing the clinker factor. But as we just heard, we have backup tools. When it comes to the influence of strength, for example, if we have a column with a specific strength of, uh, uh, th that has to withstand 340 tons, we would need 40 by 40 cent square centimeters, which is roughly uh, half of a cubic meter. What if we increase the strength to 40 megapascals so we could reduce the volume by 37%? Uh, for this column and also reduce 37% per, of the dead load. And with this, we not only achieve savings in cement consumption, but also savings in other ag uh, aggregate materials. We won't have to use more cement per volume in this concrete uh, over the amount that is saved. Uh, together with the impact of transportation and whatnot. So finding greater strength is always a sustainable solution that in Latin America, with certain regulations and codes uh, that are somewhat outdated, uh, there we are still somewhat behind. And these tools don't require significant investment, but rather updates in the construction code. This increase goes hand in hand with economic costs. These are statistics from the Argentinian Cement Institute, where a concrete of, of 20 megapascals versus 50 megapascals by, by volume shows this uh, increase in in strength that is the higher the strength the lower the cost the longer the duration and the higher the sustainability in that sense from the user standpoint designing structures with higher strength levels has to go hand in hand with higher levels of industrialization because with precarious uh, levels of construction we will have higher difficulties or greater difficulties this concept can also be explained by the additives. Here we, for example, see a study where the number of um, the number of coal embedded or of carbon embedded affects the strength as opposed to ordinary concrete and fly ash. But when we normalize by strength, 
we see that the strength levels will have a lower environmental impact. Another issue or another question is how do we decide how much cement do we place in concrete? Because this is also key. As an example, I can, I can tell you about uh, Argentinian regulations. When we do structural calculation, we look at a specified strength, but of course the, the design mix is done with the midpoint. So the further we are from the uh, midpoint, the greater the waste of cement, because we would be overestimating or underestimating cement. Uh, and not physically or chemically, but simply because of a lack of quality control. So according to Argentinian regulations is that, well, they really emphasize quality control and producing concrete, what they call mode two, where you see that the specified strength is increased by five megapascals, making this mix per that is done with a lack of quality control lead to mixes at a plant at, at a certain quality control level that is more competitive. These mixes are also more sustainable and increase the efficiency in the use of cement. Another consideration in the use of concrete is around how the concrete or, or how the cement content is defined. We use concepts such as strength and durability, but in reality, oftentimes the cement definition is done by the workability. That is, we incorporate cement to fill the gaps of the aggregate. So having a better granulate uh, structure allows us to reduce the fine cement material and even couple cement with another fine filler to fill the spaces better without having emission costs associated. There are studies in Brazil showing that you can achieve concrete mixes up to 80 megapascals with 300 kilos per cubic uh, meter of concrete. And so this allows us to prove that we not only need the reactivity of cement, but that reactivity is oftentimes underused because the cement simply serves to fill the gaps between the larger particulate matter. So mixes with a greater optimization where we suppress the effects of inclusion and the wall effect, where we achieve a good balance between the fine and the coarse, that would allow us to save in cement consumption or allow us to replace this fine material to serve the same purpose of gap filling. As Ricardo showed us, FISEM's strategy to reduce the carbon footprint for the industry is based on several uh, several parties in the markets. Uh, I, I won't go through all these figures, but this roadmap, for example, in Latin America, shows that by 2050, we will have an increase in, in the clinker demand of 115 million tons and also an increase in the demand for supplementary material at 111 metric tons. So it's 65% more than what is currently being consumed in the region. So we have to find alternative sources of minerals, which for the most parts are found naturally in the Andes and in Central America. In Brazil, uh, not so much. It's used in certain parts of the country, but the barriers are really regulations and the use, um, and and the use of certain materials in Latin America, uh, such as limestone, 
I won't go much into the details, but you can read more about this in the paper. This would include uh, the red lines in Brazil where further acknowledgement is still needed uh, when it comes to the use of this material. But what is true is that we have the possibility of achieving low clinker levels by using local mineral additives. To conclude my presentation, uh, the, uh, I have a few final thoughts. First, we have to think that Latin America and the Caribbean is very heterogeneous, and the strategies to reduce the carbon emissions must consider the local conditions in the regions and geographical characteristics, together with the individual characteristics, uh, characteristics of each country. As Ricardo well said, the needs for investing in carbon emission reductions have to align with the human development needs and therefore the strategies, the low cost strategies are the most convenient in that regard. There's a trend in reducing the clinker factor that's worldwide and in Latin America, this is also being done at the international level as Ricardo showed us. Uh, the region is doing well but can be improved uh, using other materials. It's important that when we talk about these uh, cement additives, that a large part of the users of this material uh, have different uses uh, per region, uh, given uh, past experience, which has shown uh, a poor performance in certain products especially when it comes to quality control and updating regulations. From the user standpoint, the carbon footprint can be improved for concrete and cement, which, which would facilitate not only the mixes, but also reducing waste. The matter of quality control, for example, uh, when it comes to strength, and durability in the structures of Latin America are quite critical, actually, especially in the warmer areas and tropical areas. This is something that is still that still needs many improvements. Uh, so I'll conclude my presentation there, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Jury. Thank you for your excellent presentation. You touched on several important subjects from a technical standpoint, together with the opportunities we have in the region to reduce our carbon footprint. We only have 10 minutes for questions. We will not, unfortunately, be able to answer all of the questions in the chat and Q&A for today. However, if you have any specific questions, we ask that you look at the paper that was published where much of this information and much more detail is included. So let's begin with the questions from our audience today. This one might be for Ricardo, somewhat of a provocative question. Consuming cement or lower cement consumption, is that convenient to cement producers? Well, that's actually a really great question it would seem contrary to the industry. It would seem contrary to good business. But I think uh, the only possible business is delivering a carbon neutral product and continuing to produce CO2 uh, is not an option. So it's better to, to uh, have a low carbon product than to continue to raise carbon levels. So that's kind of a paradigm that we have to do away with because it's about social integration. These are, this is just like the airlines that had to cut certain, uh, certain flights to reduce their CO2 footprint where it matters. So we are seeing many of these transformations and, and provides greater efficiency. So many paradigms have to do, have to be done away with. And and carbon neutrality, of course, and is important to the cement industry. And optimizing the product, even if it means lower sales, it's part of the things that must be done. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Ricardo. Another question that is somewhat uh, provocative. In Europe, a lot has been said that, that once we have green technologies or green energy rather, much of the carbon footprint attributed to clinker production will be reduced because those high temperatures will no longer be an issue. What uh, green electricity technologies has BSEM seen in Latin America? Again, Latin America is super, super diverse. We have countries that are highly technical uh, in the Caribbean, for example, and there are other countries that have uh, carbon neutrality in electricity, as is the case of Costa Rica. So you really have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Latin America is natural conditions. Now, uh, Europe, I think, made a, a green agenda without considering costs, without an actual crisis in, in, in and and that goes against uh, any policy that might apply for Latin America. Of course, when you need heating and and when the war comes, such as the war uh, that that Russia started uh, comes around, that's where heating becomes an issue and the costs uh, really start to become a factor. One great example from Europe, uh, where they did not consider economy as much. Um, uh, can be seen uh, as not as applicable for Latin America. And and we have this matrix here because we have hydro, we have other capacities as well to help with uh, electricity. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now a question for Yuri. What does the future look like as far as con concrete durability when using low carbon additives in cement and cement. Well, that subject is somewhat controversial. We must first look at why we're using concrete because con or, or uh, because concrete is used for many things. And when people think of durability, they think about reinforced concrete or, and, and that's where the issues arise. But there are also th statistics that show that only 40% of structural concrete is reinforced and 60% of structural concrete is not reinforced. So the carbonization, which is such a, a serious issue when it comes to emissions, is not actually an issue for most of the structures made in concrete. In the future, I see this as something that would not have a major impact. And in fact, in Latin America, there are natural materials found in the mountains. And these natural materials are additives that really improve the durability as opposed to other materials. So with a higher level of additives uh, leading to a lower level of, of durability, I don't think that's a fair stance. If I could add one thing there, I think one of the major issues that we have is the types of technologies or the testing methods that we use to assess durability when we do this in an accelerated manner. Many of these testing methods have been developed for Portland cement and under climate conditions that do not apply to Latin America because, because uh, they have very varying climates. So when assessing those materials using those testing methods with those conditions, they might not be representative or not representative enough as far as the lifetime of the material uh, in this region. And that's, that's why I, I also ask that we all question how we're assessing durability in materials and what do the values actually mean when looking at it in context, in the context that we'd like to develop in. And if I could add something very quickly, of course, we must also think that 
durability of structures isn't just an issue of the uh, uh, material wise, but there are other factors. In Latin America, I've worked for many years and most of the issues around durability are due to a lack of uh, curing and a lack of maintenance, lack of reinforcements uh, with structures that are that are under supported, let's say. There are many other issues apart from the material in Latin America that are quite present that have to be better looked at and not simply try to make concrete that is excessively strong to address issues that can be better resolved uh, by addressing other factors. Thank you. We have time for just a couple of questions more. One more question that has come up here is the use of red mud as supplementary material. This is, a, is this especially true in Latin America or no? It isn't used in Latin America. There are studies even in Brazil uh, because they do have a lot of this red sludge uh, production. But when it comes to implementation, there's still a lack of knowledge on the matter. But yes, it is something that is gaining strength, not just for the cement industry, but also in metallurgy, which needs to produce material that is much more circular, let's say. Maybe two final questions. One is, uh, one that was emphasized in the presentations, one of the main challenges to the region is the use of concrete overall. So how can we make it so that concrete is used in a more, well, the question says in a more professional way, but let's say in a more industrialized way. We believe, uh, and, and I'll, add, I'll answer a few more things with this question. We believe that the footprint that we've estimated after many years has determined that 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 uh, most of the cement is in fact clinker cement. So in the short term, we'd have to find a way to use less clinker for cement or use it more efficiently. Uh, that's in, in, in broad terms, the answer to the question, lower use of clinker, which would change uh, the production of CO2. And we're working strong in that regard. Uh, using uh, hydrogen and other fuels, et cetera. And I saw that question come up that I, that I thought had to be addressed as well, because when speaking of carbon neutrality, we have to see where our footprint lies initially. As far as the concentration, we're looking at three pathways in academia. Uh, since academia has an incredible voice in the region, and this paper is in fact a product of that. But where is change really enabled? in three places. First, in public investments. We have to analyze all the criteria that we find when it comes to construction. We have to look at public policy, and that's something that still isn't happening. Second, the, the actual customers or clients. If it doesn't come from the demand side, it'll be very difficult to change production as well. So the clients are the second important point. And thirdly, much more effective communications. We With you know color, uh, you know concrete is gray, and oftentimes it 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 goes by unseen. So communications, academia, and facilitating understanding of concrete, all of that plays a role. Plays the role that FSM is assuming in convincing people with science-based data uh, about uh, what we have to resolve to reduce our carbon carbon footprint, and that's at the cultural level especially. Yes, and I think that that's why activities such as the activities today, this uh, seminar is important when it comes to teaching and training and disseminating information. These are all strategies that surely will help us to think differently. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left. One last question before giving the floor back to Natalie. Legislation when it comes to CO2 in Latin America is scarce. 
they considered that certain measures, do you consider that certain measures will, will be taken in that regard? We do monitor the regulatory frameworks around CO2 in the region. And, and we do have countries that have committed to reducing 50% of their footprint. Uh, and, and that at times, will cause loss of competitiveness uh, when it comes to the regulatory framework. And we also see legislation where, where uh, carbon is trying to be replaced, which has been proven worldwide to not be as effective. There are, there are 40 countries that have these kinds of regulations around carbon worldwide, but only three use taxes to do this and they are all in latin america so we're we're basically begging the authorities to to move in a different direction not because we want to pay less but because co2 ultimately isn't reduced and and, and taxes is not a solution so we're looking at that and we're looking at legal and judicial aspects and with the authorities around the environment we're having them understand that the price of carbon can be moved in a different way but we still don't have the models that we would like thank you very much judy and ricardo for your time and for your valuable lessons that you shared with us today i would now like to conclude by inviting Natalie Triana from FISEM, who has some information to share with all of you. Thank you very much for assisting, for attending this seminar. Thank you for your excellent moderation as well, Susan. It was all perfect. Very well. Thank you very much once again, Ricardo, uh, Judy, and Susan for your time and for this conversation, which I'm sure was quite interesting to all the participants. We will. You can now see the scheduling for FISEM for the for this year, so that you can join us at each conference. These conferences are scheduled for the last Wednesday of every month, as you see on screen, at 10 in the morning, Columbia time. We expect to see you there on those dates. And we also ask that you follow us on our social networks so that you find out about our about all of FISEM's activities together with other cement industry updates. To answer the question that came up often in the chat, this webinar will be available on FISEM's website, www.fisem.org, as of next week.